Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I want to thank you all again for coming to uh, attend our annual luncheon. It's been wonderful to have uh, such a fine turnout. We appreciate it very much. We particularly want to thank our table sponsors, uh, Clark Hill, Dickinson Wright, Jacobson Demir, Kitsch Dretches Wagner, Villatati and Sherbrooke, and Kindbaum, Hardy, Viviano, Pelton, and Forrest. We also want to thank, thank John Lynch, who has a table with friends. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you. Thank you. I would like to also introduce the members of the board who are here by asking them to please stand and be recognized, members of the Society's Board of Directors. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Just a few brief remarks on behalf of the Society. Um, we're delighted to say that despite the uh, 18 months and counting of no events um, and so forth, the, so the society remains in good financial position. We're particularly thankful to the Supreme Court for uh, providing us uh, with, uh, as we have for the last uh, almost 30 years, a, a small portion of, of IOLTA funding. As some of you may know, there was a new administrative order this year uh, capping our funding at 5% uh, or $50,000. We're appreciative of that uh, continued support. We know from our conversations with societies all across the country that without uh, the support which allows us to have um, one permanent staff member, we would, as it was the, with the case of many societies, no longer be in existence. And we're, we're appreciative of their support, as well as your continued support. Um, over two-thirds of the members of the Historical Society are life members, and therefore are under no obligation to give us annual contributions, and yet so many of you do and we're enormously appreciative of that, and it has kept the, the uh, society in good financial health. For those of you who are here as friends of the society, perhaps for the first time, we hope that you will join our ranks and make a contribution to the preservation of the history of the Supreme Court, the history of law in the state of Michigan. Um, we plan to continue uh, doing our work as we have during the pandemic. We have worked on oral histories of all of the justices, which are available on our website. We have four new portraits, which uh, over the course of the next year or so will be hung in uh, the Hall of Justice or in the chambers of the court. We're continuing a number of important historical writing projects. And we also look forward in 2022 to an ambitious agenda. We hope to return to having a breakfast event with the justices, which we've done in Grand Rapids and Traverse City. We hope to continue that relatively new tradition. We're hoping to start a new tradition to have a portrait gala at the Hall of Justice to celebrate our portrait collection, to provide uh, distinguished uh, speakers to talk about both the artists and the history of the members of the court. So we hope that when we uh, announce the date for that, all of you will attend. We've been working to lay the groundwork for a journal for the society so we can publish the scholarship uh, about the court that the society has uh, provided support for. Uh, we also want to thank especially those of you who are members of the Advocates Guild, which in addition to uh, being part of the Historical Society, 
requires you to give an additional contribution. Every uh, uh, year we've had an Advocates Guild dinner. Unfortunately, at the last minute due to COVID, we had to cancel that a few days before the event because the Supreme Court chambers were no longer available. Many of you very kindly either donated your contribution for that event or applied it to this luncheon and we are deeply grateful for your support. So thank you again for the support of the Historical Society and uh, thank you very much for coming today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker for the, for the uh, afternoon, Professor Paul Moreno. Paul is a professor of history and the Dean of Social Sciences at Hillsdale College where he holds the William and Bernice Green Grucock Chair in Constitutional History. He received his BA from the State University of New York and his MA and PhD in History at the University of Maryland. In, in addition to teaching at Hillsdale, he has held visiting professorships at Princeton University and the University of Paris School of Law. He's the author of many notable books including From Direct Action to Affirmative Action, Fair Employment Law and Policy in America, Black Americans and Organized Labor, The American State from the Civil War to the New Deal, The Bureaucrat Kings, The Origins and Underpinnings of America's Bureaucratic State, and his next book, due in 2022, is How the Court Became Supreme, the Origins of Jur Juristocracy in America. He also writes frequently for the popular press and has been interviewed regularly on radio and TV on legal subjects, especially those involving constitutional law. <coughs> Excuse me. We, of course, know him best as the author of the Society's Verdict of History Project, subtitled The History of Michigan Jurisprudence Through the through its significant Supreme Court cases, which some of you may remember was published as a four-part series in the State Bar Journal from December 2008 through March 2009, and which has been republished as part of the Society's Michigan Supreme Court Historical Guide, second edition, which, by the way, is a marvelous resource that every Michigan lawyer should own and is available for purchase from our executive director, Carrie Sampson, and there are some samples available on the table in the front. Paul is an outstanding teacher, as one of his students, Emily DePanger, who took his constitutional history course, has been quoted as saying, Dr. Moreno is an excellent combination of intelligence, wit, and enthusiasm. He inspires love of history through his extensive knowledge and the concern he shows for each of his students. I have no doubt that you will agree with Emily's assessment after hearing today's lecture on Frank Murphy and the Roosevelt Court. Professor Moreno. Thank you, Carl, for that very generous introduction. How do you get Carl to do your eulogy is what I wanted to know. Uh, it's indeed an honor uh, to be invited to speak before uh, this audience, including so many distinguished members of the Michigan Bench and Bar, and I'm very proud to have been a part of the work done by, the esteemed, by our esteemed historical society to preserve the history of our state's legal world. Uh, today I'll be talking about Frank Murphy, uh, who was the second Michigander on the U.S. Supreme Court and President Franklin Roosevelt's fifth appointee to the U.S. Supreme Court. Murphy cemented a liberal bloc on the court following the so-called Constitutional Revolution of 1937, when the court finally accepted the New Deal. Murphy brought a liberal activism to the court that made him a precursor to Earl Warren. Murphy's liberalism often appeared to derive from his Catholicism, especially that of papal social encyclicals. But ultimately, he displayed a very personal and idiosyncratic judicial style. Benjamin Cardozo called it pardon my German, Gefühls Jurisprudence. If you're wondering why that word is up there, uh, I, I, it's a long German word, and I want you to see it, uh, which he defined as judgment based on subjective sentiment and feeling rooted in the 20th century philosophy called emotivism, 
which viewed moral judgments as expressions of an individual's preferences and dislikes. Murphy did not serve long on the court, less than a decade, and he saw the court assignment as a consolation prize for an unfulfilled political career. The chief justices who assigned opinions held Murphy in low regard, so he got few major roles. In 1945, he told Felix Frankfurter that, quote, as is done to useless horses, I have been put to pasture on the court after a lifetime of decency and truthfulness. Almost all commentators agree that Murphy's talents did not mesh well with the judicial office, especially that of a high appellate tribunal. Murphy's personality significantly shaped his political and judicial career. Analysts have the benefit of Sidney Fine's comprehensive three-volume, 2,000-page biography. Fine engaged in considerable psychohistory and concluded that Murphy had a narcissistic personality. Murphy said that he read no novels because, quote, no novel could be as exciting as my own life. <laughs> Fine says it was essential for Frank Murphy to believe that the public position he held at any time was, figuratively speaking, the center of the universe. Many have claimed that Murphy was the first homosexual chief justice. Considerable circumstantial, but no direct evidence supports this. He was a lifelong bachelor and extremely close to his mother and sisters. He had a tremendous sense of destiny and a messianic streak like that of Woodrow Wilson. His personal relationships were certainly very complicated. Despite his conspicuous concern for the downtrodden, he preferred to socialize with the well-heeled and celebrities. He enjoyed a reputation for honest government that few other big city bosses possessed, yet he was rather careless and indulgent in his personal financial affairs. Despite the homosexual innuendos, he was something of a chick magnet. For all his ideological passion, he could be cold and aloof. As Fine observes, Murphy loved people in the mass more than he loved particular individuals. Murphy's grandparents emigrated from Ireland to Canada. Family lore includes martyrs to the cause of Irish independence. His father was a Fenian, arrested and acquitted in Canada for his political activities. He was christened Michael Francis Murphy, but changed his name to Frank because his father told him that no great men ever had middle names. Murphy attended public schools in the Thumb region of Michigan by Lake Huron. He was brought up on Jeffersonian Bryanite democratic politics. Murphy barely graduated from the University of Michigan Law School, earning several Ds and Fs. But when he became Attorney General, U of M Law School Dean Henry Bates called Murphy the best student I ever had, even, <laughs> even though he'd given him a C in wills. Murphy was trained as an officer in the First World War, but arrived too late for combat. Upon his return, he won his first political office as a U.S. assistant attorney. After some time in private practice, he won a seat on Detroit's criminal recorder's court. He established a reputation as compassionate or soft on crime. He became politically prominent by presiding over the murder case of Ossian Sweet, an African-American physician accused of killing a white member of a racist mob trying to drive his family out of their Detroit home. The other judges on the recorder's court tried to avoid the case, but Murphy saw it as the opportunity of a lifetime to demonstrate sincere liberalism and build political support. With enthusiastic support from the city's black and immigrant population, he was elected mayor of Detroit in 1930, where he battled for relief in a city that had been particularly hard hit by the Depression. Murphy's for support for Franklin Roosevelt won him the office of Governor General of the Philippines, where his Catholicism and support for Filipino independence made him very popular. Roosevelt then solicited Murphy to run for governor of Michigan in 1936. Michigan had been an overwhelmingly Republican state since the Civil War, voting for the Republican presidential candidate in every election until 1932. There were sessions of the Michigan legislature in the 1920s without a single Democratic member in either house. The state had 255 Republican newspapers to 16 Democratic. But Murphy managed to win by a narrow margin. He took office shortly after the Flint sit-down strike began, an episode that would do more than anything else to shape his career as well as American constitutional law. In 1935, the conflict between the New Deal and the Supreme Court had reached a crisis point. The court had struck down several New Deal acts especially those regulating industrial and agricultural production and labor relations. Congress responded with the so-called Second New Deal, highlighted by the National Labor Relations Act, called the Wagner Act for its sponsor, New York Senator Robert F. Wagner. The act required employers to bargain collectively with whatever independent organization was chosen by a majority of its employees. 
A group of radical auto workers in Flint went further than the Wagner Act. When General Motors refused to recognize the United Auto Workers, instead of quitting work and picketing to prevent replacement workers from getting into the plant, they occupied the plant and refused to leave. They could pelt besiegers with auto part missiles and hold valuable plant machinery hostage to sabotage. The governor, acting, it was commonly understood, at the behest of the president, made it clear that he would not use force to eject the strikers. He sent in the National Guard, but did so to protect the strikers against local law enforcement and vigilantes. The strikers regarded the guardsmen as fellow picketers. GM eventually obtained a, a court order to oust the trespassers, but Murphy refused to enforce it. Within a week, GM responded to presidential pressure, and the company came to terms with the union. But the ramifications of the crisis would reverberate for years. On February 5, 1937, the same day that the Genesee County Court had granted GM its writ of attachment, FDR announced his plan to pack the Supreme Court. Many saw Murphy's refusal to enforce the court order and Roosevelt's attack on the court as two sides of the same lawless coin. Within two months, the court would suddenly abandon its opposition to the New Deal, particularly when it upheld the Wagner Act in April. Historians still debate whether the court had caved into political pressure, and some have argued that the justices had responded to the sit-down strikes in particular. They may have surmised that the Wagner Act offered a preferable way to manage industrial disputes. So future Justice Frank Murphy played a major role in the Constitutional Revolution of 1937. The court packing plan and the sit-down strikes provoked widespread outrage and crippled both President Roosevelt and Governor Murphy. Though peace came to Flint, the sit-down tactics spread across the nation to public chagrin. However ambivalently Americans may have felt about unions in the Wagner Act, the lawless sit-down method had almost no defenders, and the Supreme Court would hold that it violated the Wagner Act in 1939. The sit-down strikes and the general reaction against the New Deal, especially the intense Roosevelt recession that began in 1937, doomed Murphy's re-election bid in 1938. Roosevelt took care of his Michigan protege as best he could, making him attorney general at the end of 1938. Murphy preferred the post of Secretary of War as a stepping stone to succeeding FDR in the White House. In the White House. And this was a real prospect. Jim Farley reported that Murphy was third on Roosevelt's list of preferred successors in 1940. It seemed rather audacious to turn a governor who had refused to enforce the law into the nation's chief law enforcement officer. But Murphy had prepared for such a contingency. He produced a letter that he had written to John L. Lewis, the head of the CIO, at the height of the sit-down crisis, saying that he would enforce the court writs if necessary. This so-called law and order letter had no impact in 1937. It was, Fine writes, a document for the record that some, at, at some later time could be cited as evidence of Murphy's belief in the sanctity of the law. It did the trick, and Murphy was easily confirmed as Attorney General. Conservative Justice Pierce Butler died in November 1939, creating an opening for the so-called Catholic seat on the Supreme Court. Murphy was an obvious choice. He was a Catholic. Pope Pius XII called him the ranking American Catholic in 1946. From the Midwest, Butler had been a Minnesotan, and he confirmed liberal. But a series of rumors circulated as to why Roosevelt really made the appointment. Some thought that Murphy had been an incompetent attorney general and was being kicked upstairs to make room for Solicitor General Robert Jackson. His detractors claimed that he was, quote, a poor administrator who saw dangerous reds and honest radicals, is queer and inept, and lacks any real ability, Arthur Crock reported for the New York Times. Still more nefariously, some said that the president sought to abort Murphy's criminal investigations of powerful Democratic big city bosses whose support Roosevelt needed for re-election. Robert Jackson and Justice Department, Gen uh, Department attorney Gordon Dean thought that Roosevelt was indulging in spiteful retribution to the court to demonstrate his complete contempt for the court and because Roosevelt could think of no worse punishment to inflict on it than Frank Murphy. Murphy was very reluctant to take the court seat and leave active politics. He had real doubts about his own ability and said that he was afraid that the court was beyond his grasp and that my work will be mediocre up there. Roosevelt told him that the door was open to future executive offices. And in the meantime, he told Murphy that he could engage in politics on the court, approving legislation for the people, preserving liberties, almost rewriting laws that will do it, Roosevelt said. The Senate confirmed him 69 to 23, 12 days after the appointment with no hearings. Murphy joined the most controversial and dysfunctional Supreme Court in American history. Melvin Urofsky entitled his volume on the Stone and Vincent's Court, 
division and discord. These years were really the Roosevelt court shaped by his eight appointments. FDR assembled a court that one historian said resembled nine scorpions in a bottle. Hugo Black, Roosevelt's first nominee, was a populist demagogue among the most radical members of the Senate. He barely survived the post-confirmation revelation that he had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. William O. Douglas, who became the court's longest serving member, was a radical legal realist and activist whom historian G. Edward White described as the anti-judge. Douglas's personality was also extremely off-putting. One, one biographer called Douglas one of the most unwholesome figures in modern, modern American history, a liar to rival Baron Munchausen. Douglas claimed to have served in the army in World War I and having recovered from polio to do so. He neither served nor had polio. <laughs> Apart from being a flagrant liar, Douglas was a compulsive womanizer, a heavy drinker, a terrible husband to each of his four wives, a terrible father to his two children, and a bored, distracted, uncollegial, irresponsible, and at times unethical Supreme Court justice who regularly left the court for a summer vacation weeks before the term ended. In 1939, Roosevelt added Felix Frankfurter, the renowned Harvard law professor and informal presidential advisor. Manipulative and haughtily professorial, Frankfurter also added to the toxic atmosphere of the Roosevelt court. By 1943, with the arrival of Roosevelt's last appointee, Wiley Rutledge, the court clustered in two ideological camps. On one side were those who believed in judicial self-restraint, lest the new liberal justices repeat the sins for which they had condemned their conservative predecessors. This group, often called the Judicial Process or Process Restraint School, was associated with Harvard and Felix Frankfurter. On the other side were the Yale realists, willing to use judicial power for progressive purposes now that the liberals had taken over the court. Frankfurter and Robert Jackson were the most prominent conservatives. Murphy would join Rutledge, Black, and Douglas, composing what Frankfurter called the Axis. When Frankfurter could not win Murphy over, he became the chief promoter of Murphy's reputation as an incompetent, clerk-dependent, political hack, and bleeding-heart liberal. He quipped that Roosevelt had tempered justice with Murphy by his appointment. In 1944, he told Murphy that his list of clients include, it consisted of, quote, reds, whores, crooks, Indians and all other colored people, longshoremen, mortgagers and all other debtors, railroad employees, pacifists, traders, Japs, women, children, and most men. Must I become a Negro rapist before you give me due process, Frankfurter asked. On the point of judicial power and democracy, Frankfurter asked him, what is the difference between you and Louis XIV when you say I am the law, just jurisdiction or no jurisdiction? Popular and academic commentators alike expressed dismay at the antics of the Roosevelt Court. Murphy got more than his share of the criticism. Historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote in 1947, Murphy is a strange, complicated, self-dedicated figure. His egotism is vast and somewhat messianic. His legal competence is questioned more often than that of any other justice. Yet his devoted concern for individual rights has produced some of the most impassioned writing in recent court history. Murphy was deeply offended by the article, which he believed had been orchestrated by his brethren on the court. President Harry S. Truman blamed his predecessor's personnel decisions. He told his wife, Bess, that Roosevelt's court appointments are somewhat disgraceful. Murphy was still angling for an executive or diplomatic appointment in 1945, but former Justice James Burns reported that, pre that the president considered Murphy a nut, and so he stayed on the bench. Murphy wrote 130 majority opinions, 20 concurrences, and 69 dissents. About one-third of the total were technical tax cases. He's best known for his dissents. His chief justices, Harlan Fisk Stone and Fred Vinson, held Murphy in low regard, and so did not assign him many important cases. Harlan Fish Stone called him the weak sister on the court. Stone said that Murphy relied too much on his clerks and had to be reminded that the job of the court is to resolve doubts, not to create them. Murphy raised a lot of doubts in his maiden decision, Thornhill versus Alabama. New justices traditionally got to choose their first case. Here the court struck down a state law that prohibited picketing. The court held that picketing was, a, was protected as free speech under the First Amendment. This case is notable because it stressed two of the principal features of the post-New Deal court. It continued the, the so-called incorporation of the Bill of Rights, by which the court gradually applied Bill of Rights, originally limiting only the federal government to the states. Murphy also emphasized the recent case of U.S. versus Caroline Products, which announced the so-called preferred freedoms doctrine. 
The court announced in a footnote that from now on it would assume the constitutionality of laws affecting ordinary commercial transactions, but would apply a more stringent standard for laws affecting non-economic rights, particularly those of the Bill of Rights, and the rights of quote unquote discrete and insular minorities. This signaled the agenda of modern liberal jurisprudence, which would reach its peak under Earl Warren. Murphy embraced it enthusiastically. Minorities, he said, are the children I never had. The Thornhill Doctrine proved very ephemeral, however. Labor law scholar Charles O. Gregory called it one of the greatest pieces of folly the Supreme Court ever perpetrated. Within a year, the court held the picketing could be enjoined if a strike produced an atmosphere of intimidation and violence. Felix Frankfurter wrote this opinion, and Murphy joined it, walking back his apparently anything goes original position. Subsequent cases whittled away at the Thornhill Doctrine, uh, some concerning stranger picketing, secondary boycotts, and strikes for unlawful purposes. One commentator wrote that picketing was a legal Cinderella, which a fairy godmother Supreme Court had allowed to be a princess only until midnight. That fairy godmother would have been Frank Murphy. In 1950, shortly after Murphy's demise, Justice Douglas lamented the final demise of the Thornhill Doctrine. One critic called Murphy utterly uncritical in his support for labor unions. This aligned with the Roosevelt Court generally. The court declared the complete exemption of unions from the antitrust and racketeering laws. As constitutional scholar Edward S. Corwin put it, the court was setting up as a sort of super legislature in the interest of organized labor. Constitutional law has always had a central interest to guard. Today it appears to be that of organized labor. Murphy was at the center of one of the Roosevelt Court's most contentious cases, writing the opinion in the Jewel Ridge or Portal to Portal case. The United Mine Workers claimed that the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act, which was largely the work of then Senator Hugo Black, required employers to pay workers for the time that it took them to get to and from their jobs. It could take coal miners, for example, quite a while to get from the mine head to the coal seam. In the Jewel Ridge case, the court overruled a Labor Department determination that it did not. The UMW retained Hugo Black's former law partner and Klan Cyclops mentor, Crampton Harris. Justice Jackson took umbrage that Black had not rec recused himself and wrote a dissent that alleged that Senator Black had interpreted the FLSA in a way contrary to Justice Black. The Jackson-Black feud reignited when Chief Justice Stone died in 1946 and Jackson publicly denounced Black to prevent his elevation to the Chief Justiceship. This tirade convinced Truman not to promote Jackson, whom the president described as surely having gone haywire. FDRI told Murphy that on the court he could be almost rewriting laws, and he did so in this case. But with millions of dollars of potential back pay liability at stake, Congress explicitly overruled the Jewel Ridge decision. In 1947, it declared that the FLSA, quote, has been interpreted judicially in disregard of long established customs, practices, and contracts between employers and employees, thereby creating wholly unexpected liabilities, immense in amount, and retroactive in operation, which would be ruinous to interstate commerce. The act went on to cut off lawsuits under the Fair Labor Standards Act, one of the few occasions in which Congress has exercised its power to limit their jurisdiction of federal courts. Justice Jackson said that the Supreme Court has never had such a rebuke at the hands of Congress. And with the court acting like what Newsweek called Santa Claus to labor unions, the same Congress also made significant revisions to the Wagner Act in the, in the Taft-Hartley Act. The war gave this uncertain new justice a sense of his mission to protect unpopular minorities. Murphy had always possessed this inclination, but it clashed with his patriotism and his keen desire to promote the war effort. He trained to be an army officer during the war. It was not technically illegal for him to remain on the court and serve in the army so long as he was inactive. But it struck many as improper, and he embarrassed some of his brethren when he dramatically appeared in court in uniform. His dual status compelled him to recuse himself in one of the most contentious cases to arise out of the war, that of several Nazi saboteurs tried by a military commission. In the first case of the, of the war involving the relocation of Japanese Americans, he allowed Felix Frankfurt to talk, to talk him out of, of, of dissenting. Murphy began his crusade in defense of minority rights in an opinion that overturned the revocation of the naturalization of Russian-born William Schneiderman because he had been a member of the Communist Party when he applied for citizenship in 1927. Murphy held that Congress had not intended to apply the law to the particular facts of this case, which involved doctrinal utterances and academic or theoretical exhortations, rather than holding the law itself unconstitutional. Murphy admitted that he was uncertain about the legalities, 
but it certainly was a result-oriented and personal decision. He wrote to his brother that there our forebears are here as the result of the old world's passion for exile of all of those who do not conform to certain religious and political beliefs. Now, after having one faith all my life, tolerance towards those whom I have the least in common with, at this juncture, I am not going to start the trek of exile back to the old world. Editorial opinion was mixed, but law reviewers uniformly panned the opinion. It widened and intensified the divisions on the Roosevelt Court. But in this case, Murphy seemed to find his voice. As one biographer put it, he was becoming reconciled to his position by, by turning it into a pulpit. One commentator suggested that Murphy acted boldly in the Schneiderman case to atone for having let Frankfurter talk him out of dissenting in the first Japanese-American case, Hirabayashi versus United States. That case limited itself to upholding the curfew order. It did not address the relocation. The court upheld that program in 1944 in Korematsu versus United States, a decision that will live in infamy. It provided the occasion for one of Murphy's most memorable opinions in dissent. Murphy said that the exclusion program goes over the brink of constitutional power and falls into the ugly abyss of racism. By the way, the first time the term racism was used in the uh, Supreme Court. Murphy conceded that civilian judges should not scrutinize military judgment too closely, but asserted that this program had no rational basis. It derived from, completely from misinformation, half-truths, and insinuations that for years have been directed against Japanese Americans by people with racial and economic prejudices. The justices need not refer to sociological bunkum described, dis disguised as military discretion. He warned that the program mimicked the abhorrent and despicable treatment of minority groups by the dictatorial tyrannies which this nation is now pledged to destroy. We ought not to adopt one of the cruelest of the rationales used by our enemies, he concluded. I dissent, therefore, from this legalization of racism. Korematsu was Murphy at his best and his worst. He was on the side of the angels and wrote vividly and courageously. But the opinion also smacked of what a latter day would call virtue signaling, a self-righteous display of personal offense and moral superiority. As a dissent, the opinion was of no real consequence. Had it been the majority opinion, the government would surely have ignored it and exposed the court's fecklessness in wartime. Justice Jackson's dissenting opinion better recognized that the decision did more than just injustice to the Japanese Americans. It implicated the court in a grave threat to the entire constitutional system. African Americans were the largest and most oppressed discrete and insular minority group in America, and Murphy championed their rights as well. His experience in Detroit had taught him that the idea that, quote, Negroes have constitutional rights in our big cities is purely a fiction. During World War II, the court put down an attempt by all-white railroad unions to drive blacks out of desirable jobs. Progressive and New Deal labor legislation had empowered racially discriminatory unions, so in these cases, two liberal interest groups, organized labor and blacks, two of his children, were at odds. The court held that all unions had a duty of fair representation. Though they did not have to admit blacks as members, they could not blatantly bargain away their interests. Murphy concurred, but said that the court had dodged a grave constitutional issue. He thought that the court had overlooked the utter disregard for the dignity and well-being of colored citizens, which raised Fifth Amendment concerns. He denounced the cloak of racism surrounding the actions of the white union in refusing membership to Negroes. No statutory interpretation can erase this ugly example of economic cruelty against colored citizens of the United States. One commentator noted that judicial activism was never clearer than in this opinion. Religious minorities also attracted Murphy's solicitude. The principal cases that applied the religious freedom clauses of the First Amendment to the states involved the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Witnesses were a radical sect that regarded almost all participation in public life as idolatrous offense against God. One scholar describes them as millenarian, eschatological, Gnostic, prophetic, theocratic, sectarian, missionary, and evangelical. They proselytized loudly and offensively against mainstream religions, especially the Roman Catholic Church. Murphy, in keeping with his principles of tolerance and justice towards those I have least in common with, included the witnesses among his adopted minority children. One commentator quipped that if Murphy were ever canonized, it would be by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Murphy had joined all the justices but Chief Justice Stone to uphold Pennsylvania's compulsory flag salute law in 1940. Three years later, Murphy joined a new majority in striking down a similar West Virginia flag salute statute. Many believe that the justices had reacted to news stories about persecution of the witnesses. Murphy was just following his gut. 
I write the law as my conscience bids me, he wrote. The constitutional law of religious freedom really took off with the 1947 case, Everson versus Ewing Township. The court had incorporated the free exercise provision of the First Amendment in a 1940 case involving the rights of Jehovah's Witnesses to proselytize. In Everson, it held that the no establishment clause also applied. Everson involved a subsidy given by a New Jersey town for the transportation of students to Catholic schools. Justice Black announced that the Establishment Clause imposed a quote unquote wall of separation between church and state, using a phrase from an 1802 letter by Thomas Jefferson to a group of Connecticut Baptists. In years ahead, secularists would repeat that phrase so often as to eclipse the actual text of the First Amendment. Curiously, Black held that the transportation subsidy did not breach this wall. Justice Jackson for the dissenters pointed out that he could not reconcile the wall of separation standard with the result in this case. In the long run, the decision would prove a pyrrhic victory for the religious as the court would build up the wall of separation to a near total prohibition of any public support for religion. Ultimately, insofar as morals legislation had a religious basis, it would do away with the state's police power to legislate for the morals part of the public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Finally, Murphy made a prescient comment in his dissent in Adamson against California in 1947. In this case, the court held that the self-incrimination provision of the Fifth Amendment did not apply to the states. It reiterated an early, earlier point by Justice Cardozo that only those provisions of the Bill of Rights that were implicit in the concept of ordered liberty would be incorporated. Justice Black objected to this doctrine of selective incorporation as giving too much discretion to judges to pick and choose which rights they favored. He claimed that the 14th Amendment intended to incorporate all of the provisions of the Bill of Rights, no more and no less. Murphy, in turn, caviled at Black's total incorporation doctrine. He said, I agree that the specific provisions of the Bill of Rights should be carried over intact by the 14th Amendment. But I am not prepared to say that the 14th Amendment is limited by the Bill of Rights. Occasions may arise where a proceeding falls so far short of conforming to fundamental standards of due process, despite the absence of a specific provision in the Bill of Rights. This position, known as total incorporation plus, took hold decades later as the court protected unenumerated rights such as privacy. Many other cases show Mercy, uh, Murphy expressing his intuitive sense of justice in defense of the unpopular. He strenuously objected, objected to what he thought were vindictive cases against communist unionizer, union organizer Harry Bridges and Japanese General Yamashita, the Tiger of Malaya. And much like Earl Warren in the Brown case, he sought to make his opinion short, simple, and understandable by every American. Dissenting in a case that permitted a death row inmate to be sent to the electric chair a second time after the first attempt had misfired, he told his brethren in conference, we have nothing to guide us in defining what is cruel and unusual punishment apart from our own consciences. Our decision must necessarily be based upon our mosaic of beliefs, our experiences, our backgrounds, and the degree of our faith and the dignity of the human personality. Indeed, Murphy went beyond his own, personally, his, his own personality and projected it into others. He called the prisoner's anticipation of a second execution attempt an, angu an anguish that can only be fully appreciated by one who has experienced it. Only by those who have experienced it and by particularly sensitive souls like his own who had not. In 1949, at Murphy's untimely death at the age of 59, along with Justice uh, Rutledge's nearly simultaneous passing, effectively ended the Roosevelt Court. Harry Truman's four justices moved the court in a markedly more conservative direction and reduce the liberal access to just Black and Douglas. But in the late 1950s, and especially after 1962, Justice, Chief Justice Earl Warren would revive liberal jurisprudence and turn many of Murphy's dissents into majority opinions. But few of the Warren court decisions acknowledge Murphy. Many have blamed Murphy's jurisprudential weakness for this neglect. As one commentator wrote near the end of his life, if any justice uses the gastronomical approach to decisions, that is, votes by the nausea or pleasure he gets from hearing the case, it is Murphy. This accorded with the skeptical realist view that decisions could depend as much on what a justice had for breakfast on any given day as anything else, or Oliver Rundle Holmes's famous statement of his standard of unconstitutionality, does it make you puke? One historian called Murphy a thoroughgoing liberal who had little regard for technical questions and believed that the objectives of law should be justice and human dignity. Even more than Douglas and Black, Murphy cared little for precedent and openly relied on what one commentator called his visceral jurisprudence. 
But many Warren Court decisions displayed equally result-oriented and gut-based gut -based Gefühl's jurisprudence. Warren himself often told counsel to cut through the legalities and ask them, yes, but is it fair? The aversion to cite Murphy was probably more a matter of rhetoric and style. Murphy's opinions, as one uh, commentator put it, were too extreme, too emotional, too sweeping, too unqualified to invoke in the Warren court years. They were too close for comfort. To cite Murphy would expose the fact that they, the Warren court justices, were just as instrumentalist in their decision making as Murphy had been. As G. Edward White, the premier judicial biographer, observed, Murphy resembled Warren, but the same posture that invoked ridicule in Murphy was the source of Warren's strength as a judge. Warren had more gravitas and understatement. One biographer concluded that Murphy was fundamentally an emotionalist rather than a craftsman. The Murphy style would emerge again with the later Catholic justice, Anthony Kennedy. Kennedy shared much of the vanity, pomposity, and, self and inflated self-importance often attributed to Murphy. Whatever his religious beliefs or sexual orientation, Murphy would surely have followed Kennedy's path in the abortion and homosexual rights cases, given his solicitude for those he perceived as victimized minorities. In particular, when one reads the famous mystery passage in the 1992 Casey case, the quintessential expression of modern liberal Gefühl's jurisprudence, one cannot help but hear an echo of Frank Murphy. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. And with that, Murphy himself remains something of a mystery for the historian. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that wonderful talk, which reminds us again of the value of legal history, telling us all that when people say, wasn't it great when everybody got along, nobody said, unkind things about one another, <laughs> and, and law was easy, that they're really making it up. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate your support. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful year. Thank you all.